popular accounts of history reached a new peak worldwide in the late 20th and early 21st century. Significant factors. The significant factors played a crucial role in that, such as the increase of leisure time and with that a correspondingly rising thirst for entertainment, a rise of general educational standard, even history education standard, and partly also of disposable income, possibly also, especially in the West, the demographic development with a growing expectancy of life as well as an increasing need of orientation and context of meaning in a more and more dynamically changing world. Um, last but not least, the increase of mass media presentations of history in anniversaries and commemorations as a medium for political statements right up to propaganda and to address collective identities and loyalties. And now, after the lecture of Charlotte Bülgrama, I have to add that I forget something very important, and this is the tourism. The tourism, I think, uh, creates very much need for uh, historical presentations. She had a lecture about panorama as com entertainment and commercial entertainment, and I think we ha I have to add there later the tourism. In this context, an international phenomenon can be observed in which, the, which, in the face of the quantity and diversity of audiovisual offers and popular historical culture in the field of television, film, as well as computer and video games, provokes amazement, but at the same time proves the theory of media studies that new kinds of media not auto automatically replace older kinds, but rather change them. A very traditional medium, which in Europe dates back to the 19th century, which has no moving pictures or sounds or interactive options, has been rising since the late 20th century. More and more titles of popular history magazines have appeared in an increasing increasingly dynamic and internationally networking market for these magazines, whereby the situation can differ significantly from one country to another. While some have a long tradition like Great Britain, also France, and a little bit also Russia at least, uh, while some have a long tradition of those magazines and have adapted only to modern conditions over time, Completely new approaches can be found in other countries due to major political and uh, social changes. This is true for uh, Soviet Union and Ru today Russia. Then again in other countries, not to be neglected in a global scale, the culture of commercial history magazine is hardly older than 10 or 20 years. This is true also for the Republic of China, but also for Brazil. Even if some newly established magazines, often also as extension lines of established magazines, or as import of other countries' formats, are not on the market for a long time. The overall conclusion is, however, that media companies broaden the range of diverse history magazines, which means they assume a certain demand or believe that they can create it so that the investment is worthwhile. Even if the number of customers and readers of those general interest magazines or knowledge magazines, as they are classified in journalism, cannot compete with the consumers of TV or other audiovisual media, history magazines appear to be a phenomenon within international historical culture which deserves attention from the feet of history didactics not as least because history teachers, pupils, and even history students are among the readers or buyers. In the limited time, I would like to address the three questions that are on the basis of our history project. The first is what means popular with respect to history magazines and how does popular relate to entertainment? Second, which concept of history do the magazines represent? Can we draw conclusions regarding our examination of entertainment? And third, how can the concept of entertaining popularization of history in the magazines be evaluated 
from the view of history didactics. Please note that my following comments relate only to so-called special interest magazines, that means on magazines that deal with history in general, and not with specific sub-themes, these are very special interest uh, magazines, like specific periods, people or objects, also may be old, old mobiles, and so on. Also, not, also right-wing military magazines will not be considered despite stable sale, stable sale figures and even growth rates in some countries are to be seen now. Uh, what means popular? In line with the emergence of post-industrial societies, which are often referred to as knowledge societies, also a branch of research has been established since 10 or 20 years, which deals mainly with the historical popularization of scientific knowledge, that means with the presentation of new knowledge gained by experts using academic methods to a broad, non-specialized, but educated or at least interested audience. This research nationally followed a hierarchical, one-sided, linear um, diffusion model, which implies that the special knowledge which is inaccessible, so they sought it, in, to the general public is delivered in a simplified way by the researchers themselves or by journalists. This uh, popularization process has several strategies and there is consensus in the research, such as contextualization of knowledge, attribution to relevance, language, uh, it means the barriers have to put to uh, the specialized terminology has to be put out, metaphors and analogies that correspond to, correspond to everyday life, and especially the narrativization of the research process. By now, this model is opposed by another widely accepted one which <coughs> describes the popularization of knowledge as an interactional process which is directed by the recipients and their own interests as well and is not derived solely from the academic discourse but has a significance in its own right. Overall, this popularization research so far has not only neglected the role of commercial interests in these processes, but also the topic of history. This research focuses very much on natural scientific knowledge, not on historical knowledge. Raising the question of what exactly our magazines popularize, our research revealed the following. The classic popularization of new academic results and approaches plays a role only in minor cases. A recent example for that could be the interviews with Christopher Clark, the author of the successful book The Sleepwalkers in history magazines which deal with World War I. However, the far more important trend is that the magazines popularize the popular. This means that in fact of most, in most cases, independent also from blockbuster events in public historical culture, such as TV shows and period movies or famous exhibitions, magazines often go for topics with which potential consumers can relate to their prior knowledge and conception. Thereby, it does not matter if historians or journalists write the articles, however, the latter is, of course, more common. Even though the relation to historical science might be very little, and especially very selective, which, which makes a classification of history magazines of popularization of science questionable, the rhetorical reference to science in the magazines themselves and in their self-representation, for example in editorials, plays a decisive role. The editors assure their readers that the articles are strictly science-driven and the presented historical knowledge is thus authentic and reliable. According to them, the difference to science allows 
along the self-representation of the magazines depict the past world, and this is in their eyes the only difference to the science in a more graphic, in a more illustrative, and a more vivid way. That means the readers are promised immersive experiences, a term from media psychology which describes an intensive immersion into the depicted world and aided by a focus of historical, on historical imagination. This means the aesthetic function of historical culture. It's like a uh, panorama. Uh, the aesthetic function of historical culture and thereby an emotional, pro emotional proximity to the distant past. Interestingly, these editorials rarely use the term entertainment, which shows that the st stereotypical contrasting juxtaposition of light entertainment and serious engagement is intact in these magazines. History, it seems, cannot per se be seen as light entertainment due to its highly relevance, although the makers of the magazines leave nothing undone to present history as light entertainment. Furthermore, the conception of the function of historical knowledge shows traditional or even antiquated views. Its task and achievement, as suggested by the magazines, is to produce objective knowledge about how the past really looked like. And that is not the only resemblance to historicism that can be found in the popular and entertaining presentation of history, not only in magazines and the whole entertainment sector. It is understandable, of course, that buyers and readers of a history magazine expect correct and verified information. However, the essence is neglected. The constructed character of historiography, the fact that historical questions and answers are bound to place in time, the extent of perspective that are given in the historical process, as well as in the often controversial or plural interpretation processes. To stress the controversial demarcations between objectivity and subjectivity, as well as between fact and fiction. This is following the argument of the publishers and editors of those magazines counterproductive for the commercial success. Only those accounts of history seem to be commercially successful in their, in their eyes, which offer room for imagination, which are opulently illustrated and above all have a good story. Thereby, the concept of history of the popular magazines diverges very much from the political and social challenges of the present world, in which increasing tensions between nations, cultures, and religions are frequently underpinned by historical arguments. Let's now turn to the second question, which concept of history do the magazines um, represent? Firstly, it has to be noted that the magazines can show huge differences in quality concerning their relation to a reliable representation of history. However, the following comments on the concept of history refer to a manifest trend that characterizes the genre, although there are exceptions. To begin with, it should be noted that historical magazines, of course, are illustrat illustrated magazines, Therefore, pictures play a constitu constitutive role and sometimes take more space than the text. These illustrations are often contemporary or anachronistic images from history, especially from the 19th century, it's the next point to historicism, or sometimes from current historical movies, thereby usually that they are not discussed as iconic historical sources. <coughs> Moreover, they are rarely references between the picture and the text. The illustrations have the function of, in their own right, they serve primarily to enhance the vividness of the topic, to emphasize the aspect of entertainment, as illustration is, is entertainment, to convey a specific historical atmosphere for the immersion, 
and at the same time, in case of historical pictures, to suggest or create the illusion of authenticity of the representation. We all know that pictures suggest a rapid, specific and clear access to historical subjects, but in reality, we all know, due to the characteristics of the iconic code, not only are more ambiguous than text, have more requirements for understanding, and finally have inherent medium-specific limitations. You can only depict the visible surface of things. For the construction of meanings, the painters or creators of pictures have to refer to semantic conventions, which the interpreter, as mentioned by Panofsky, must, turn, must in turn deduce, and this is deduced mainly from texts. The magazine's use of illustration ignores these challenges and follows the general line of a representation of history which claims to be an objective approach of the static yet very colorful historical work and by text and illustration conducts a disambiguation of historical knowledge. Limits of knowledge, different degrees of certainty or Research controversies are in general not discussed. This might be due to the fact that a good story, a vibrant, vivid, exciting, atmospheric and emotionally appealing narrative is at the center of the entertaining representation of history and is considered as essential for sales success by the journalists in charge. These narratives are in general of the traditional type there is an omniscient narrator who, of course, as omniscient narrator, does not refer to historical sources and secondary literature, and of course, does not reflect upon his, about his point of view. Upon his point of view, the action is depicted mainly chronologically and basically concentrating on events. A central requirement for a good story, as we know, is personalization. One could bluntly say that what the magazines declare as history is almost exclusively the depiction of intentionally acting individuals, whereby, again borrowing from historicism, the great man that made history, great history, sets the scene. At the same time, Personalization is a central factor for the stimulation of the recipient's emotional proximity to the temporally distant and factually alien world of the past, without which an immersive quality of experience is impossible. This uh, overcoming the distance is the center, I think. The positive or negative identification of the reader with the key actors is only possible, and this is an important precondition, if the depicted motivations and intentions of the historical actors, for example, ambition, courage, and lust for power, stay within the familiar frame and immediate human continuities. Research could actually prove that the depicted stories offer, on the one hand, a very colorful spectrum regarding space and time, peoples and persons, atmosphere and costumes, scenery and anecdote. But on the other hand, regarding the depicted action schemes, they have a fairly narrow set of very familiar everyday patterns and stereotypes, which means that beyond the historical surface, there is no historicization, historicization of the events itself. A significant consequence of personalization is another topic for narrative representation of history implies that the boundaries between fact and fiction become blurry. This is especially true for scenic, often dialogical representation of the action when the, when the actors talk to each other that mostly achieve a level of detail which goes far beyond any information of the sources. It is even more true, of course, for the figure-centered indirect speech, this is a rhetorical figure, and of course for the inner monologue, which is per se not accessible for historians. <laughs> uh, 
uh, these historical elements might remain unnoticed if the recipient is fascinated by the action and increased with various strategies suggesting authenticity, especially by mentioning historical names, accurate details, and even the name of experts. Finally, and that's the last point of personalization, um, finally, strong personalization also means that the cause analysis is often shortened and reduced to the intention and motives of the active, acting persons. Historical context are largely neglected. Lastly, I would like to address to the topics, and I can shorten it a little bit because you can read it here. The preferred topics of the popular history magazine spoken in the general are celebrities, and this is not only meant on persons, it's only meant to places, to events, and so on. And I think this concentration on celebrity guarantees to the reader and to the buyer that he can be sure to, that the discourse, the history discourse in this magazine is relevant because the non-specialist is not sure if he understands what is relevant or significant you have to decide. And the other one is that it has surely a social communication function. These topics that you find on the history magazines are topics that you can communicate with other persons. Um, the final question in this point, and then I come to the end, is at least, and I think we cannot discuss it because it's a question of the market. We do not know if the, if the customers are the factor who produces this kind of history in history magazines, or if it are the, the sellers, the enterprises who do that. But I like to remember you and then follow three sentences. Um, I would like to remind you that this is a typical pro problem of market economy. It's very different, difficult to make a differentiation when you have a market economy which is due to the supply and which is due to the offer. And I think this is a really important case of that. Let me conclude uh, with the third question. Uh, the evaluation of history magazine from the view of history didactic. It is a common opinion, and also Terry uh, is, is this a opinion, opinion, that is perceived better to deal with history than not dealing with it. I accept this opinion very much, however, there, but there are limits to that implicit views of the world and society conveyed by representation of history in entertainment or edu edutainment are very influential. This is even true if the recipients feel well informed by the richness of historical details and are not able or not willing to critically reflect upon the underlying structures and representation and interpretations uh, of the story. We have seen it for civilization uh, very clear. This, uh, the account of history portrayed by the magazines should be here now compared to a quite different postulate from the European Council. Alice Ecker yesterday uh, talked about it. And if you read his ideas of history education in Europe, the first point is a critical understanding of history. They ask for that the pupils should understand the past can be approached from different perspectives, historical events can be interpreted in different ways, and so on. You see a big gap, and the concepts presented by history magazines and other entertainment formats are mostly part of this critical understanding of the construction and use of history. At the same time, they are very com commercially very successful and influential. In the end, this only means from the view of history didactic, we have to focus on a critical education, on the analysis of those entertainment formats. But if there will be entertainment offers that have as topic the critical analysis of entertainment formats, this will remain uncertain. I do not think that entertainment formats 
will go to the step to reflect the birds. Thank you very much and excuse me. Put uh, your questions. Yes, please. Um, I would like to know whether uh, it's um, a typical, perhaps it's a typical German approach <laughs> to to ask um, um, or to divide uh, between entertainment and serious. A serious approach to history. So, is there perhaps in England as the motherland of uh, wellness <laughs> and entertainment, <laughs> and uh, where there is not that gap between entertainment and uh, serious approach to history, where uh, the novel is accepted and so on, and history writing can be also popular? Um, is there also in uh, English uh, magazines uh, this uh, gap between uh, entertainment and popular history? Uh, well, I think Terry wants to or, uh, answer. Or, uh, <laughs> or at, at the risk of sounding nationalistic, uh, I believe our history magazines in, in England, the best selling ones, BBC History Magazine and History Today, are pretty good, they're quite scholarly, <coughs> they represent different views, they do give some space for uh, the history of uh, women's contribution to history and minority groups and, and gender issues and so I think they are respectable mm -hmm. and quite good, mm -hmm. certainly compared to what you find in the newspapers and even on television. On television in England, it's almost always one historian who says, uh, and they are all very pompous, and very sure they're right, and they always say, This is what happened, as if it is the only story. And history magazines are good for making new people aware that historians disagree and different stories can be told about the same thing. So I think our magazine, on the whole, is good. Yes, uh, I can say to that this was not so much my point, the yeah. difference, and also in the opening of the conference I have talked about it, uh, that it's not the opposite, uh, entertainment and information, but in this case it's asking for the, that the entertainment is a commercial object and what we have to pay for this entertainment, and what is true is really True, but it's interesting that in Germany you often read that it's a very German uh, division between mm. entertainment and serious. But in England, the magazines are much better than in Germany. Mm. It so like it's easy to say, uh, okay, there's no division between uh, entertainment and not entertainment. You have also a lot of right wing military magazines, of course, but we did not so much. No. Okay. But uh, the best one of the British market are quite better mm -hmm. than, I think, everything we have here and the, in our project, the best articles, the most reflected. And this is not the picture I have given yes. here, are coming from your magazine. Yes. Well, I think there is room for a short, for one short question, mm -hmm. if this is possible. Yes. Susanna, I found it very interesting uh, to ask for the strategies of, of presentation, mm -hmm. how the how the uh, the magazines present uh, history, and, and as you uh, described, they try to be, to be serious and to mm -hmm. sell a kind of of, of serious uh, history. Nevertheless, um, uh, as I understood, they are not critical in the sense that we expect them to be. So. Can you say a little bit more about what you think is the message of these magazines? What 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 is the aim? What what are the objectives uh, as far as you have read uh, the magazines? Yeah, the question may be short, but the answer could not be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm really. This is a point that is uh, interesting. I think one point is, of course, this division, mm -hmm. like with you. Uh, the customers of such magazines, 
they make a social distinction, a habitual distinction to others because not everybody is giving, selling, uh, giving money for history. The second one is, of course, uh, in integration in something. You get into a discourse, you are part of a special discourse, and the magazines, I think, they are very distant from controversy and from anything that has results. I think this is due to this uh, integration and affirmation function and at least I think, it, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, but they are not very truthworthy what we get from the, um, from the publishing houses, uh, the people are beyond 50, you know, and it's also men, are more men than women. And I think it's a precondition, it's something to have orientation to like the aesthetics. It's an educated experience, yeah. aesthetic experience yeah. too. But in the core, I see distinction. Well, it cannot be true. Yeah. Yes, um, I think um, it's very difficult to give a short answer <laughs> on this question. And um, I uh, think there would be quite a lot of questions, yes. but to be honest, to the other uh, speakers, That's I think there. we uh, change now.